everyone. Welcome back to the Big Fly Baseball Show. I am your host, Victor Rojas. This is the fifth installment of the Big Fly Baseball Show. I'm so glad you've uh, been able to tune in, whether it's on the uh, any of the podcast uh, streaming services or via the YouTube channel at Big Fly Baseball Show. Uh, I appreciate all of the subscribers, the likes, the messages, and the uh, comments that I've received so far. And please keep them coming. Happy to help uh, in any way possible and love to interact with fans uh, whenever we can. Uh, obviously, was not uh, part of the podcast last week. Didn't generate a podcast last week. My son arrived home from college. He had a friend in town, uh, plus getting my college baseball schedule um, kind of uh, straightened out a little bit as we get closer and closer to postseason. I'll talk about that uh, as well. So that's why I wasn't able to do a, a show last week, but uh, here we are back at it. Uh, again, if you are uh, listening on the uh, podcast, you can find us on uh, Apple iTunes, Amazon Prime, or Amazon Music. Uh, you can find us on Spotify, iHeart as well, and plus the uh, YouTube uh, channel. It's a Big Fly Baseball Show is the YouTube channel. So uh, a lot of great things happening in baseball. And uh, typically, if you if this is your first time listening to the show, uh, thank you. Welcome. Uh, this is uh, kind of off the cuff. It usually runs about 30 minutes thereabouts. Sometimes I go a little bit longer, uh, but I don't like to, to waste anybody's time and kind of give you my, uh, my take on what's gone on in the previous week and maybe some stuff that's uh, upcoming. There are a couple of topics that um, I'm probably going to touch on uh, this week, just even though they're a couple of weeks old, but something that I think is important from the amateur baseball perspective. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that, uh, plus Paul Skeens and, and the like. And um, anyway, just kind of uh, welcome to the show and uh, I'm glad you are uh, tuning in and uh, let's get after it as far as the uh, uh, the standings are concerned. Look, I, I think uh, when you when you start looking across uh, all of the teams in, in Major League Baseball, there's still no doubt that the best team in baseball from a from a roster perspective and uh, what you have collectively and what could be in the pipeline as far as guys coming back. Obviously, are the Los Angeles Dodgers. They're leading the, uh, uh, the National League uh, Western Division uh, by seven and a half games. The Padres are just an even 500. Um, and then you've got some teams that are trying to figure out who they are. I'm surprised where the San Francisco Giants are. Uh, I didn't think that they were going to be uh, close to a 500 ball club. Uh, I thought they were going to struggle. Uh, they've got Blake Snell that's on the mend, and he should be coming back soon. I know he threw rehab uh, this past week. Then you got the Arizona Diamondbacks that continue to struggle. Diamondbacks have been dealt uh, kind of a, a uh, odd hand as far as injuries are concerned, as well as lack of performance. And that's why they find themselves three games under 500 at the start of the week and nine games back in the West. Uh, you know, for me, everybody in that National League West is basically playing for a, uh, a wild card spot. Uh, in the National League Central, the Brewers still leading the way. They've got a two game advantage over the Cubs. Cubs are playing uh, uh, pretty good baseball. Uh, I like what I've seen from the Cubs, especially on the offensive front. Uh, the Pirates are in third place, six games back in the Central. They're about four games under 500. Uh, but I think they've just injected some life into their fan base as well as their season with um, having called up Paul Skeens uh, a couple of day, a couple of weeks ago and then having made his second start on Friday. And I'll touch on that a little bit. Uh, the St. Louis Cardinals still somewhat of a mess. Uh, I think uh, John Mozalak uh, is getting crushed in St. Louis. Uh, the crowds don't seem to be what we are have grown accustomed to seeing in St. Louis, which is, I think, uh, a little bit of a shame. There's six games under 507 back. Uh, and I don't know that there's anything really on the horizon well, where the Cardinals could potentially turn things around. Nolan Arnott is a little bit of a different guy. Paul Goldschmidt, a little bit of a different guy. Those are two key cogs in the middle part of that order, um, plus uh, the pitching issues that they've had. So uh, Reds bringing up the rear in the uh, National League Central. Uh, not overly surprised. They're just eight and a half back, a game and a half back of the St. Louis Cardinals. So there's still some hope there, I guess, to to kind of leapfrog the cards. Uh, the National League East is interesting in that the uh, Philadelphia Phillies, and uh, I'll, I'll come back to the Phillies. Phillies leading away five better than the Braves. Then you've got the Mets continue to be kind of a little bit of a mess, uh, Nationals and the Marlins. But I will touch on the Phillies-Braves situation as well as the Dodgers here in just a sec. American League West, it's it's still the Seattle Mariners. Uh, it, it's still a very mid-division. Nobody is separating themselves from anything. The only thing that stands out now is how well the Houston Astros have started to play of late. Uh, Alex Bregman starting to get hot. Jordan Alvarez still has not gotten it going. And while the Astros have had 
their bullpen woes uh, up until this point. Uh, Kyle Tucker is just a stud in right field. And this is a guy who's a free agent to be, and I can't believe uh, that they'll let him get to free agency. That's that's one of those guys that you want to you want to lock up as much as possible. Bregman as well uh, is a guy that is a free agent to be. Uh, but the Astros, all of a sudden, uh, they've won eight of their last ten, are five games under five hundred, and in third place in the American League West, four back uh, of the Seattle Mariners. Rangers, uh, they just lost two of three to the, uh, the to the Angels this past weekend at Globe Life Field. Rangers is still in second place, or an even five hundred ball club. It's kind of an offense. Uh, they can't figure things out. They've had some issues on the on the pitching front as well, um, but they're still hovering at 500. And you know, when you figure what they were able to do last year, they are missing Josh Young at third base. Although he's starting to uh, starting to the, the the progressions are starting to get better and better for him uh, as far as his rehab is concerned. He'll be a huge boost to that lineup on the offensive front. Uh, but they are just kind of hovering right now, and I think. Look, if you can hover in the American League West and play decent baseball, you've got a chance uh, just because nobody's separating themselves. The uh, the only team that continues to struggle, the two teams really, <coughs> excuse me, is um, the Oakland Athletics have come back down to earth. Uh, they've lost eight straight now. They're 19 and 30, just a little bit ahead of the uh, Los Angeles Angels that find themselves at 18 and 29. That's even after a series win in, in Texas. Uh, both of those teams seven back, but uh, Oakland just ahead of them percentage wise, 388 winning percentage versus 383. American League East, still the Yankees. Uh, they've got a two game advantage over the Baltimore Orioles at 33 and 15. Uh, then you've got the Rays at eight back, Red Sox, nine and a half. Blue Jays uh, are somewhat of a mess. Uh, Ross Atkins, the general manager of the Blue Jays, came out and spoke to the media over the weekend. Look, I, I think while there have been a lot of expectations, of the Toronto Blue Jays, especially with the young core of players that they have in uh, Guerrero and Bichette and Biggio to a certain extent, signing uh, George Springer, uh, you, you thought, plus the promise that you had heard about all the starting pitching. Now, they do have apparently some pretty good arms and uh, some talent at AAA, but it just really has not materialized for the Toronto Blue Jays. And I think that window is really starting to shrink up for them in the American League East, especially with what the Orioles have uh, in tow as far as their their current major league roster plus what they have at the minor league levels the Rays you can never count them out and the Yankees with the way they're playing uh and and Juan Soto has just been I touched on this a couple of weeks ago Juan Soto has just been uh, amazing for them now Aaron Judge is starting to get into a little bit uh that's a very good team so I think it's it's going to be tough for the Toronto Blue Jays to be able to turn things around and you wonder whether or not they become the first team to uh make a managerial change uh, this season. Then the American League Central, you've got the Cleveland Guardians still leading the way. The Kansas City Royals, which I'll touch on the Royals, they're a game and a half back. Twins, five and a half back. Tigers, and then the lowly White Sox, who uh, got beat up by the Yankees this past weekend, swept by the Yankees this past weekend. And uh, it, if you really want to get a a snapshot, a glimpse, a synopsis, if you will, of the struggles and what is going on with the Chicago White Sox. Watch the play from Sunday's game with a man at third base on a check swing and what Jose Trevino, the catcher of the Yankees, does uh, in picking off the runner at third base. Uh, it, it is just uh, just bad fundamentals, uh, not being in the game, not paying attention to the situation. Uh, and if you haven't seen the video, simply stated you have a right-handed batter check swing Trevino points down to first base uh to for the appeal and as he's doing that looks over toward third base fires the third and they pick off the guy at third base who was also looking across the diamond to the check swing and kind of haphazardly getting back to third base so that that pretty much sums up uh what the Chicago White Sox have been this year it's unfortunate they are minus 99 in run differential minus 99 almost at the century mark um, and we are at the quarter post, or just beyond the quarter post mark uh, of the Major League Baseball season. So that's where you, uh, that's where we stand right now at the beginning of the week. I mentioned we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the Phillies. Now the Phillies sitting atop the American or National League East division. People are wondering whether or not the Phillies are the best team in baseball. And yeah, by record they are uh, the best team in baseball. There's no doubt about that. Uh, rotation wise, they've got three studs in that rotation. Ranger Suarez, Aaron Nola, 
uh, and Zach Wheeler, not necessarily in that order, but those are three very, very good uh, starters to, to, to front any rotation. Uh, the very back end of the bullpen has been solid for them. Uh, the Phillies offense has been uh, a little bit better from last year. They do have some issues uh, offensively in the outfield. Uh, and the one thing that stands out as far as the Phillies are concerned, and I don't want to dog the Phillies by any stretch of the imagination, is the fact that they've, they've not played a very difficult schedule. And I know people are going to throw that out there and talk about, well, you know, they're beating up on teams that uh, aren't very good and haven't played a team over 500 since late March. Uh, I don't think that really matters a whole, whole hell of a lot. You've got to take care of business no matter what. And if, if, to me, if you're looking at uh, a team like the Phillies or any team in Major League Baseball, you should be beating the shit out of the bad teams. That's the goal. Uh, so that when you do start facing teams that are above 500 um, and or within your division, you start, uh, you know, if you end up losing a series, you're all right from a record perspective. So I, I wouldn't I wouldn't dog the Phillies uh, for having taken care of their business. Um, I, as a matter of fact, to me, I, I think it's uh, kudos to them that they have been able to do that. I think you should be playing great baseball against the crappy teams, uh, and try to play 500, if not just a tick better against the, uh, the really good teams. And I think the Phillies are going to do that. They're going to stretch into, uh, they're going to have a stretch of games here coming up, uh, a long stretch against very good teams and we'll see how it plays out. But right now I think, um, uh, they are by record, the best team in baseball. Are they the most complete team in baseball? No, I think the Dodgers are still the most complete team in baseball. Plus, they're getting some guys back. And I think you, you saw that with Walker Bueller back in the rotation. Um, it, it's just a, a really, really good team. And, I, you know, you can say whatever you want about, you know, all the, uh, the, the Hollywoodness of uh, the Los Angeles Dodgers. They deserve every bit of the accolades uh, that they are getting because they are a really good team. Uh, the Braves, I th still think, are a really good team. Talking about the three teams in the National League that I, I think are the best teams in the National League. Braves are still there. Um, I The amazing thing about the Braves is the fact that they've been able to do it with guys like Ronald Acuna uh, and, and Matt Olson and uh, Austin Riley not being 100% of producing at the levels that we've grown accustomed to for them to, to, to be doing it. Um, Pitching has kind of kept them in there, and I, I still think they're a very good team. Um, once injuries and once these guys with track records start to get back on track, if you will, um, I, I think it's going to be a really, really good team to beat, uh, down the stretch. And you can't, you know, look, the history that the Atlanta Braves have shown over the last couple of years of what they've been able to do, um, through the course of 162 game schedule into the postseason, it's hard to discount a team like that. That's how good they are, how fundamentally sound they are for the most part. Um, and how well they've played uh, under Snitker. I just think it's a, a team you you cannot count out. Uh, but I think, um, you know, kudos to the Phillies for taking care of business and having the best record uh, in baseball as we, uh, as we start this week. As far as the, um, the other team that uh, I touched on uh, a little bit ago that is uh, fun to watch right now at the Kansas City Royals. And now I'm wearing – uh, my, my buddy's shirt, Charlie hustle, charliehustle.com. This is a Kansas city shirt from, from him. Uh, it's, uh, listen, I grew up in Kansas city. I think most people realize that, uh, in my, at, at, deep down, I've, I have two favorite teams, Kansas city, where I grew up and my dad played for, and then the angels where my dad managed and coached or, uh, was a front office executive. And then I obviously had uh, a broadcasting career with, so those are, those are my two teams, but the Royals, um, nobody, nobody wants to talk about the Kansas city Royals, or at least you don't hear a whole lot about them. And I've touched on it a little bit on what they were able to do, what JJ Piccolo did over the off season in getting some veteran guys, uh, for, uh, the rotation. And, uh, those, those guys are, are, are paying dividends. They really are. Plus the, the maturation process of the young guys. Look, it's a team led offensively by Bobby Wood jr. There's no doubt about that. Um, but there are other contributors. And the fun part of this past weekend is that uh, they celebrated the 2014 team uh, this weekend. And uh, that was a team that got to the World Series, lost to the San Francisco Giants, and that pretty much the same team came back in 2015 and uh, and won it all. So next year at this time, we'll be celebrating the uh, the World Championship, second World Championship in Royals history. 
Um, but you go back to the team, uh, the 14, 15 team, obviously they had a, an incredible nucleus uh, of young players and Mike Moustakis and uh, Eric Hosmer, Alcides Escobar, uh, Alex Gordon left field, uh, Salvador Perez, who's still <laughs> catching uh, at the major league level, uh, plus the bullpen that those guys had back then. That They shortened games up big time with Kelvin Herrera, Wade Davis, uh, and Greg Holland. Uh, those were fun teams to watch. And, and with that celebration, you saw this different batch of Royals sweep the Oakland Athletics. Uh, and now have won eight of their last 11. I think it's just a a, a fun team to watch. Um, they're going to start a series against the Detroit Tigers, so they're playing within the division uh, beginning tonight. And uh, I just I wish there would be more uh, being made of the Kansas City Royals, the story of the Royals, just because I think it's been uh, a lot of fun to watch. And if, uh, if you want to catch this shirt or any of their uh, Charlie Hustle stuff, Go to charliehustle.com. Uh, and that's that's a, not a paid advertisement. This is actually a shirt that I've had for a number of years. If you can't tell, it's already faded. Uh, one last, uh, one little nugget on uh, on the Royals, not necessarily the Royals, but a former Royal that is going to be in the Royals Hall of Fame someday, uh, Zach Greinke. So Greinke moved to Arizona uh, a couple of years ago. Or if not, I think it was actually this past year. And he went out and last week, um, through live batting practice to four rehabbing Arizona Diamondbacks players. And uh, it, you know, it, it, it brought up the question of whether or not he is thinking about extending his major league career. And there's a possibility of that. The beauty of it is, is that uh, his quote, uh, when he was asked about it all, uh, he said, quote, my arm feels decent at the moment. I was trying to get as good as I could at golfing the past two months. And I was like, why am I trying to be a pro golfer when I'm already kind of a baseball player, pro baseball player? So I figured I'd throw a little and see how it goes. Close quote. That's uh, we'll see what happens uh, as far as Granky is concerned. The Diamondbacks uh, probably could use him. The Royals probably could use him. Um, and we'll see if he's got enough in the tank and or the desire to ramp it up to a point where he can contribute to a uh, to a major league team. I think it'd be a uh, I think it would make perfect sense for the Kansas City Royals to bring someone like Zach in if he's got something left in the tank, and especially with the way this season is going for the Royals and maybe uh, turn things around, I think it would be perfect uh, to have him uh, in, in the fold of what could be an exciting season for Kansas City as this season plays out a little bit. Uh, staying with the, uh, the pitching side of things, uh, I mentioned Paul Skeens got called up Made his major league debut at PNC Park in Pittsburgh uh, about 10 days ago and then made his uh, second start uh, on Friday at Wrigley Field. Now, if you don't know about Paul Skeens, uh, I remember hearing about this kid because I was still in uh, in California uh, doing Angels baseball. Uh, he's an Orange County kid, born in Fullerton. He's just 21 years of age now. Went to El Toro High School. Uh, El Toro is in the uh, Lake Forest area. Uh, as you're going down towards Mission Viejo and uh, really good baseball program. El Toro High School is a, an incredible baseball program. A lot of great baseball programs in, in Southern California, but El Toro is uh, you know, where Nolan Arnato, uh, Matt Chapman went to school. So uh, Skeens uh, went to high school there. And what a lot of folks don't realize, because you, you saw what he did last year at LSU, what he's doing now um, at the major league level is, he really wasn't a full-time pitcher. He was a two-way guy, but he was primarily a hitter first and a catcher. Um, and he did that in high school, uh, had a phenomenal uh, high school career, uh, was courted quite a bit by a lot of, lot of power five schools, uh, really didn't get into the pitching full-time until, I, if I'm not mistaken, it, it was his junior year as a closer, and then it just kind of evolved. Um, but Paul went to the Air Force Academy. And um, that's where he he wanted to go to school uh, and did both things there. He was an offensive player. He was also a pitcher, um, caught uh, terrific player. As a matter of fact, he won the John Olerud two-way player award in college in 2022 uh, at the Air Force Academy. And uh, it was after that sophomore year, two great years at Air Force, uh, that he decided he wanted to transfer to LSU. And obviously we saw what he was able to do at LSU and uh, he became the number one overall pick last year. 
uh, pitched in five games, just a little over six innings uh, in the minor leagues last year, kind of dipping the toe, had a really good uh, spring training, went down to AAA this year, made seven starts down there, had 27 plus innings, had 45 strikeouts and walked eight, and then obviously got called to the big leagues. The interesting thing about the start on uh, Friday, uh, yeah, everyone keeps talking about skeins and it, it, how good of a the excitement of the hype of this young player kind of matched what Steven Strasburg went through, maybe even Mark Pryor to a certain extent. Um, what I was reminded of when I saw Skeens at Wrigley Field was the Kerry Wood strikeout game. Uh, I just I just saw this guy just dominating early on, seven consecutive strikeouts to start the game for Skeens. He went six innings in that game, threw a hundred pitches. No hits, 11 total strikeouts. And I think that's why everyone's really, really excited about seeing what this guy can do um, at the major league level. He's just uh, enticing. And like anything else, right, when you see guys, especially throwing in the upper echelons of 90 and touching 100, going to 101 in that start on Friday, it's one of those things where you want um, and hope for guys to not have any any injury issues whatsoever. Um, and uh, I, I root for guys like Paul Skeens because I think he could be really good. And I think that's what makes the Pittsburgh Pirates uh, even more intriguing as the season progresses. If he's continuing to do what he does at 21 years of age, uh, he is as polished a pitcher as uh, it comes in, in Major League Baseball. From a minor leagues, from a, from a college to minor leagues to the big leagues progression, um, he is phenomenal to watch, and I think he's got a chance to be very, very special. And uh, just got to make sure that the injury bug stays away from him. We got to wrap him up in uh, in bubble wrap and make sure that nothing happens to him. Um, I mentioned uh, the the college side of things with LSU, and I'll touch on the the, the all the stuff that's happening this week in college. But um, amateur baseball is one of those things that I've kind of been a part of uh, because of my son the last couple of years. He's now in college, obviously, so. Uh, I'm still dipping my toe in the uh, amateur space a little bit. And uh, for those of you that didn't uh, see it, uh, I posted on it on on Twitter or X. And uh, But if you didn't catch it, there was a an article that came out. Actually, it was really a press release initially announcing um, that perfect game uh, that does showcases and tournaments and the like and have been doing it for a long time, signed a deal with Fanatics. And... Uh, there was a press release regarding that. And then the, the following week, there was an article in The Athletic uh, by Britt Garoli uh, talking about the this, this newfound um, partnership between Perfect Game and Fanatics. And for me, as a parent, um, the, the most troublesome thing about this whole deal is that whether you go to a tournament or a showcase or whatever it is, uh, that's perfect game related. Uh, essentially, what this partnership does is it allows fanatics to manufacture um, trading cards with the likeness of your kid. Um, so you're signing your waiver and essentially signing over to perfect game and fanatics what seems like in perpetuity and for no compensation at all, um, your name, image, and likeness uh, for a kid. And it doesn't matter what age. And it can it can continue onward for an extended period of time, uh, even up until the way it reads into college and beyond. Uh, so that's, uh, uh, this is more of a public service announcement. Before you take your kids to a showcase, and it doesn't matter what showcase or what company's running it or whatever the case, make sure that you read anything and everything having to do with signing away your rights. I don't think this is the right thing. Uh, I think it's bad. Um, I, 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 I can't imagine, um, you know, my, my, my two cents were that when they put the press release out, they had a list of a bunch of major league players that um, have invested have in the last couple of years invested in perfect game as if that was supposed to be some sort of draw to, say, okay, this is, this is all fine and good. I think there is a big problem with this. Uh, and it, and it really is a, a, a precursor to much bigger problems in the amateur space. And, I, and look, and there's a lot of people that reached out and that are, 
really worried about where the amateur space is going. Um, so hopefully it starts to get rectified a little bit, but, uh, if you get a chance to, to read up on it, uh, please do so there's, like I said, the articles in the athletic, I'll post, I'll try to post a link to it in, uh, on the YouTube page as well. Um, but just make sure that you read everything. If you've got kids, uh, whether it's in baseball or any other sport that you're reading everything before you sign away any rights whatsoever, uh, college baseball, college baseball, regular season has come to an end. Uh, for the most part across the board and most of the, uh, tournaments, conference tournaments are beginning, uh, this week. I bring that up because obviously I've been doing college games, uh, for the last two seasons. It started last year doing the big 12 tournament. It evolved into doing regular season games this year. Both I did, um, ACC, um, uh, ACC, SEC, and I did a combination game of uh, big 12 as well. And, uh, it's been a blast. And now this week I'm heading up to, uh, to Arlington to, uh, to call some, uh, big 12 action as well. Then I got a regional the following week and a super regional. Uh, so it's, uh, an exciting time of year right now, uh, with everything that's going on, uh, in college baseball. I think this is when everybody starts to dial in. I think the majority of the power five stuff, uh, begins on Tuesday and, uh, a lot of good teams, a lot of excitement going on. I get the big 12, like I said, uh, Oklahoma is the number one uh, seeded team uh, in the Big 12 tournament. And uh, there's some teams that are starting to play. As a matter of fact, I had TCU hosting Texas Tech uh, last month, and I called that game in Fort Worth. And at that time, Texas Tech was kind of trending upward. TCU was kind of lost. TCU was in this space where they had no idea where they were at offensively. They were, uh, they were not performing. And ever since we did that game, it's just kind of been flipped around. Uh, Texas Tech, as a matter of fact, is the 10th seeded team uh, in the uh, Big 12 tournament. And TCU ended up getting hot and playing much better baseball, much like they did last year. Last year, they ran the table in the Big 12 tournament, won that, uh, and then were able to get to the College World Series through the uh, regional, super regional route. And uh, it was a fun story to watch. I'm not saying they're going to do that again this year. They had some pretty good <laughs> offensive players uh, on that unit last year. Uh, but those are the kind of stories that I love about college baseball. You just never know uh, what's going to come out of it. And uh, I'm excited about this week. Uh, majority of those games are on ESPN or ESPN Plus. Uh, and uh, I hope you tune in and uh, let me know what you think, um, who your uh, favorite teams are. And uh, we'll see what the SEC has to uh, what they're going to do in Hoover. Uh, Tennessee is the number one seed there. Uh, Kentucky's a really good team. George has been playing really good baseball of late. Uh, it's weird to see LSU is a team that has struggled all season long and all of a sudden they've gotten hot. Florida was really bad in the sec. They needed to go into Georgia this past weekend and win two or three. They beat Georgia two out of three. So they're playing a little bit better baseball. Uh, I still think they're a young team and, 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 and they're more of a team built for next year, but that's the beauty of these storylines of all of these, uh, these wonderful, uh, games and players, uh, that uh, will go off this week uh, on ESPN and ESPN Plus. So hopefully you tune in and, and watch them. Uh, lastly, and you know, and ironically, I'm wearing my Kansas City uh, shirt from Charlie Hustle. Uh, cool story to share that I've, I shared it on Twitter on uh, Friday night. So uh, I have a buddy of mine named Bob Fesco. Fesco is a, uh, a talk show host in Kansas City. I believe it's 610 in Kansas City. And, uh, he and I go back and forth, uh, periodically <laughs> really go back and forth a lot during the chief season. As I complain about, uh, play calling and the like, uh, but, uh, not much during the baseball season unless something happens. But anyway, he sent me a picture on Friday night. I was just sitting there watching TV with my son and it's a picture, uh, of someone in the stands. It's the back of a Jersey and it's a uh, guy's wearing a cookie Rojas number one Jersey. And I'd look zoom in there's sure enough, there's my dad's autograph on the number one. And it just brought a smile to my face. I just thought that was the coolest thing in the world. Um, in today's world that somebody's wearing, you know, a cookie Rojas Jersey dad retired in 1977 and to see a baby blue Jersey in the stands. Um, I thought that was really cool. I showed it to my son he thought it was really cool too. And so I texted Fesco. I said, this is, this makes me happy. I said, please let the guy know that, uh, this is just an awesome thing. Well, not, but like two or three minutes later, my phone starts ringing and it's Fesco calling me. 
and uh, Bob's on the other line. I go, hey, what's up? And he goes, nah, this guy, uh, he wants to talk to you. I just had a conversation. He'd like to talk to him. Like, well, okay, put him on. So I have this conversation with Brian Rojas, and that is his last name. And so he proceeded to tell me the story that his dad, uh, born in the late 1920s, uh, was adopted by a family in New York City with the last name Rojas. He thought that that family had Dominican lineage. Um, and uh, long story short, he grew up a Royals fan because of Cookie Rojas and, and the like. And um, he lives in Virginia. Uh, this past weekend was uh, the first time he had heard all the stories about the Royals trying to build a new ballpark, which is still years away, but he wanted to make sure that he got to Kauffman stadium had never been there before. And so he was there this weekend with his family. The, the Jersey was a gift from his family to him, a birthday gift. Um, and, uh, it was a really cool conversation to have randomly out of the blue. And, uh, I shared that story on, on X, uh, the other day, and I thought I'd share it here on the podcast just because, uh, talk Royals and I got the KC, uh, heart shirt on as well. So, uh, to Brian Rojas, cheers to you, my man, uh, and to your family. I'm glad, uh, you had a great time over the weekend in Kansas city and, uh, keep wearing that, uh, that cookie shirt as long as possible. Uh, that's going to do it for this edition of the big fly baseball show. Uh, like I said, short and sweet, a little over 30 minutes. Typically what I like to do on a weekly basis, if something comes up, I'll obviously, uh, uh, I'll bring it up, uh, usually the following week, but uh, I'd love to hear what you have to say. I'm going to post this not only on the YouTube page at uh, the big fly baseball show, but I'm also going to post the entire show on my ex, uh, which is uh, at Victor Rojas as well. So please, uh, feel free to, to like it subscribe, uh, whatever you'd like to do, comment. I'd love to, uh, to, to hear it. And if you don't have X or you don't like YouTube or whatever like that, and you're listening to, um, the podcast on the streaming channels, I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to listen to, uh, the show. Um, it, it means a whole heck of a lot. Uh, I just like talking baseball, uh, love the sport, been around in my whole life. And, uh, I hope that passion comes through, um, and, uh, that you uh, take a little bit, something from it and, uh, it makes your day. So on behalf of the Rojas family here in Southwest Florida, thank you for listening and for watching. And uh, I hope you have a wonderful week. Take care, everybody. <laughs>